Good afternoon, everyone. How are you today? Hello. Okay. Uh, sorry, we're getting a late start. I uh, got a couple announcements to start out with today. Uh, the first is uh, an announcement looking ahead to Monday. On Monday, April the 23rd, the State Department and the Business Council for International Understanding will co-host a business roundtable with Japanese Ministry of Foreign Affairs to discuss opportunities for U.S.-Japan collaboration on infrastructure development in the Indo-Pacific region. Assistant Secretary for Economic and Business Affairs Manisha Singh will lead the event that will include approximately 100 U.S. and Japanese private sector representatives. The main aim is to advance common interests raised during the U.S.-Japan economic dialogue and public-private partnerships that support best value solutions to most effectively meet third country economic and global sustainability goals. Uh, both governments will seek to identify opportunities for further collaboration on financing for infrastructure projects, business to business relationships, infrastructure investment policies, project implementation, capacity building assistance in order to support quality infrastructure development. Infrastructure sectors will, will include energy, transportation, telecommunications, smart cities, water and sanitation systems that will take place here on Monday if anyone has any interest in on that. Uh, let us know. We'll see what we can do to uh, assist you with that. Uh, second, on Cuba, uh, today the Cuban National Assembly appointed Miguel Diaz Canel to be the next president of Cuba. Cuban citizens had no real power to affect the outcome of this undemocratic transition process. We are disappointed that the Cuban government opted to silence independent voices and maintain its repressive monopoly on power rather than allow its people a meaningful choice through free, fair, and competitive elections. <clears throat> Cuba's new president should take concrete steps to improve the lives of the Cuban people, to respect human rights, and to cease repression and allow greater political and economic freedoms. We urge the new president to listen and respond to Cuban citizens' demands for more prosperous, free, and democratic Cuba. On Saturday, our Acting Secretary Sullivan will travel to Toronto to lead the U.S. delegation to the G7 Foreign Ministers meeting. The agenda for the ministerial is centered around building a more peaceful and secure world and will address matters of shared concern, including counterterrorism, nonproliferation, North Korea, and also the situation in Syria. The conversations will set the stage for the G7 Leaders Summit in Charlevoix, Canada, uh, which takes place in June of this year. On the margins of the G7 ministerial, Acting Secretary Sullivan will meet with a number of his counterparts for bilateral discussions. I look forward to sharing more information about the meetings as his schedule is still being finalized. And uh, lastly, you may see that we have uh, more guests than usual, and our guests are sitting here in the front today, and I couldn't be more honored to have him, them here at the State Department. Uh, they are Uyghur journalists. They report for Radio Free Asia. I had the opportunity to sit down and talk with them for about close to an hour yesterday, where I heard many of their stories, uh, many of their stories are incredibly heartbreaking, that what they have been through and what their families have been through, most importantly, perhaps, as a result of their work to report uh, the facts of the world uh, into their home country. So I'd like, uh, with that, I'd like to announce that the United States has become increasingly concerned by the increasing levels of repression in Xinjiang, China. Just yesterday, I met with these six U.S.-based reporters whose Uyghur family members have been threatened and dozens of their family members have been detained simply because they were doing their jobs, the jobs that you all can do freely every day here in the United States, uh, most of you without uh, repercussions to your families overseas, those of you who do have overseas family members. I'd like to re recognize them today. Uh, first, we have uh, Matmajan Juma. Is Mahan is there uh, with Radio Free Asia Uyghur service journalist? Uh, next, we have Shoret Haushur. Shoret, please stand up. Thank you. Uh, also from Radio Free Asia. Uh, next, we have Alim Satov. And you're all in order too. Thank you. That makes it easier. So organized. And uh, Rohit Mahajan. Uh, thank you so much. Um, our State Department officials, uh, one of our State Department officials, our Deputy Assistant Secretary, <clears throat> was in China earlier this week and she reported uh, a little bit about what is going on in the situation that paints a very disturbing picture in China. We are increasingly concerned about excessive restrictions on freedom of religion and freedom of beliefs in China. We are also concerned about China's efforts to pressure other governments into forcibly returning Uyghurs to China or to coerce family members. And finally, we are concerned about the widespread detentions and the unprecedented levels of surveillance. 
We are grateful to these brave Radio Free Asia journalists for their work. We want them to know that we will continue to raise our deep concerns with the Chinese government. We call on China to end their counterproductive policies and freely and free all of those who have been arbitrarily detained. Uh, I'd like to mention that one of their colleagues, uh, who's not here today, I spoke with yesterday, shared with me that 23 members of her family have been round up in recent years. Imagine that you're here doing your jobs in the your job in the United States, and 23 members are round up as a result. Um, it was a uh, very illuminating conversation, and I would like to be able to introduce any of you who are interested into these brave uh, to these brave radio free journalists. Uh, after the briefing or whenever you're available and they're available too. So thank you for honoring us with your presence and we're proud to be here raising attention to your cases. Thank you. And with that, I'd be happy to take your questions. Thanks. I'm out. Uh, <clears throat> hey, happy Thursday. <clears throat> um, I just want to ask you one brief question about your Cuba comment. Yes. When you said that you were disappointed that the Cuban government went about choosing its uh, new president in the way it did, but surely you weren't surprised. I mean, there was no secret that this is the way they were going we to do surprised. it. We were not surprised. No, we were certainly not surprised, not, but nevertheless disappointed. Can I have a follow-up one, please? Sure. Um, today, Donald Trump said, we love Cuba, we're going to take care of Cuba, we're going to take care of it. Does that mean that the U.S. believes that it can actually work with the new president in trying to... Well, uh, um, as you know, we maintain diplomatic relations with the Cuban government, so that uh, that continues, but we can certainly be disappointed with the election that we don't see to be free as fair. We also recognize um, that there are strong people-to-people -people ties between uh, Cuban Americans and some Cuban families who still live back home, and also there are some uh, businesses uh, that uh, take part in uh, the Cuban economy as well. So this doesn't mean that the, the uh, Trump administration is going to roll back any kind of... Um, I'm not, uh, I'm not aware of any changes on our, on our policy. I think the President was just recognizing some of the work and people-to-people -people ties that we what, have. What are some of the steps that you think that Cuba could take immediately to improve relations with the U.S.? Well, I think uh, Cuba could do a lot of things. <laughs> Among the things that it could do, and I don't want to get into a deep, long conversation about um, our investigation into the health attacks against our U.S. diplomats, but uh, we believe that Cuba could certainly better facilitate <laughs> that. Um, they have allowed for our investigators to go down and do their jobs, but as we have said many times before at the White House and also here, that in a very small country like Cuba, they may know more than they are sharing with us. So I, say, I think that would certainly be a step in the right direction. Uh, allowing greater access to the internet, to the ra radio, to uh, tel telephones, all of those things would be a step in the right direction on behalf of the Cuban government. So would you expect um, the U.S. to reach out to the new president? I, I, I'm not aware of any phone calls or anything that are scheduled between anyone here at the State Department or uh, at the White House, but I can't comment. Yeah. Can I go to um, sure. uh, Syria uh, to pick up on where we were on Tuesday with the OPCW still not having gotten access to Duma and apparently still that situation is still the mm -hmm. same. Uh, one, what uh, do you have anything to say about that? And secondly, mm. you, you, you and I had a little bit of a conversation about potential your your, your belief that the Russians and or Syrians are tampering with any evidence of a chemical attack. Are, does the continued delay give you more concern that that, that might be the case? Yeah. Uh, so to address uh, both your questions. Uh, we can confirm that the OPCW team has still not been able to enter Duma in Syria. It is now 12 days since the attack took place on men, women, and children, those innocent civilians in Syria. We have credible information that indicates that Russian officials are working with the Syrian regime to deny and to delay these inspectors from gaining access to Duma. We believe it is an effort to conduct their own staged investigations. Russian officials have worked with the Syrian regime, we believe, to sanitize the locations of those suspected attacks and remove incriminating evidence of chemical weapons use. We have also watched as some people have seemingly been pressured by the government to change their stories about what actually occurred that night. We have reports from credible uh, people on the ground 
who have indicated that they have been pressured by both Russia and Syria to change their stories, to try to change their stories so that it doesn't appear that Russia and Syria are responsible for those attacks. We certainly know that Syria is responsible for those attacks. Okay. So the delay then does make you – increase your concern? That the or not. I mean, we well, understand the delay that certainly they were increases shot at. On, the, the on, a few on a few levels. One, the longer that those sites are not able to uh, be <clears throat> investigated by OCPW fact-finding uh, mission experts, the, lo the, um, the more that the evidence can certainly deteriorate, and that's a great concern to us. Well, we also believe that it gives them additional time to try to clean up and sanitize those sites. Okay. And, and – when you say that you have – you mm -hmm. said at one point we have also watched mm -hmm. as people have been pressured into changing their story. Do that – is, is your um, evidence that they're attempting to sanitize the area of the alleged attack, is that also something that you have – "Quote unquote," watched. Which we have credible. That you have we have credible, credible information and intelligence that leads us to believe that. Okay, and, do you, and do you, has it been successful? Do you know? That I do not know. That I do not know. I we just know that they are attempting to sanitize it. The people okay. who are being pressured to change their stories. Who were they giving the stories to? Is that people interviewed by media or? Well, by well we've seen. We, oh, in fact, I've seen um, some people interviewed um, on uh, international media. Uh, we've seen some reports run on Syrian state media, so that perhaps that's of no surprise. But just a reminder that those are uh, – that would not be a credible outlet, Syrian state media, nor would, um, in our view, Russian television on this matter, because they have a vested interest in making it seem like they are not responsible for the attacks. So, sorry to be, this be my last one on this. So yeah. do you believe that now with the delay that eventually, if and when the OPCW team gets in there, that their, that, that their investigation is going to be necessarily compromised? It might be. It might be. But, it might but that is be. certainly – that is what – that would be the goal of, of Syria. That would be the goal of Syria, so to compromise you, that information. But are you saying then that if – so if they go, if and when they get there and they do their tests and it turns out negative, that that means that the Russians are guilty of sanitizing it. But if they get there and they do their tests and that's, they find that, evidence – That's a lot of ifs. It, that's a lot of ifs. They're not there yet. But there's also a lot of ifs in the – they are – they may be trying to sanitize or – We believe they're trying to sanitize. We know, believe they're trying to sanitize. But that's a hypothetical question too, right? Uh, no, it's not because we have credible information and intelligence but that leads us to believe that. Does it follow then that if they get – if and when they get there, do their uh, do their testing and, and, and determine that there's no traces of sarin or, or chlorine, then then you will conclude – I am not a chemical been, expert. I'm not an expert on with. how long sarin and chlorine can remain – on uh, soil, on building walls, and all of that. So I'm not even going to – I'm not going to wade into that conversation. It just it seems like you're setting the stage for them to get there, do their testing, find no evidence of something, and then you can then, – then, then you'll be all teed up to say, well, here's proof that they tampered with well, the – Well, will, we will have to wait and see, ma'am. We'll have to wait and see. Can I okay. move on? Uh, Saeed, hello. <clears throat> Thank How you. are you? How are you? I have a couple of questions on the Palestinian issue. Okay. Uh, uh, can... Anybody else have anything on Syria before we move on? Okay. Uh, Kylie, okay. go ahead, and I'll, I'll come back to you then. Kylie, One go more ahead. thing, uh, just back to the stabilization efforts that are on hold right now. Um, can you explain to us exactly your perspective on the U.S. now withholding all funding for the White Helmets, given that you just had them here last month and showered, you know, positive praise for the work that they're doing? Yeah. Uh, so as we talked about the other day, the stabilization funding is under review at this time. We uh, recognize and appreciate and are very grateful for all the work that the White Helmets continues to do uh, on behalf of the people of their country and on behalf of the U.S. government and all the coalition, uh, coalition forces. They're doing incredible work in rescuing in some, st in some cases, in other cases it's recovery efforts. They're an incredible group of individuals, but I just don't have any additional information for you on, on the funding yet. But if the funding for them stops, does it mean that their work has gotten less good? Their work um, stands for itself, and that is excellent work. Is the that. Of her question correct? Has funding for their for, – for programs no, they're, that support they're, them? That all continues right now. They um, – so I just it, exchanged it has, emails with him the other day. My understanding is that their work is still going on, and um, we're, we're proud to work with them. The U.S. funding for them? Any funds that the U.S. Had, was I'm sorry? giving them? Has the funding – any funding that the U.S. was providing to, the, to this group 
ended because of the, the, the pause. The, as far as I'm aware, all of the work still continues. People's bills are still being paid. If there's anything that's a change to that, I'll certainly let you know. The U.S. contributions are still flowing. As far as I know, that all is all still is all still in play. Can you just check that though, because there's an internal State well, Department document that says on April 15th that funding would have ended. I will. I, I will double. You're not going to comment. I will on double. That, I but. will double check on that. If it's an internal document, I can't. Um, you know, I don't. We don't comment on internal documents. But I'm not aware of one floating around. If there is one that says that. Okay. okay. Are we moving on? Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Anwar is saying that it is suffering 300 million dollar financial deficit. Uh, so, in view of this situation, will the administration reconsider its freezing of about 100 million dollars earlier this year? Uh, many of you will recall earlier this year that we announced the $60 million that went to UNRWA, I believe that was in January, and uh, that went to pay the salaries of teachers and doctors. So um, that's, that's sort of one of the first things I want to uh, bring to your attention. Uh, no decision has been made at this point about additional U.S. funding for UNRWA. Uh, Secretary Tillerson said, and this is still the policy that we are operating under, and that is concern about UNRWA coming back to the United States and other countries with uh, emergency funding requests. Um, at the end of the year, they will often, for many, many years, come back and say, we urgently need more money. So the United States and other countries, for that matter, would like to see them come up with a more fair and equitable and more predictable type of funding mechanism for UNRWA so that UNRWA doesn't need emergency funding every single year. So I just don't have any uh, decisions or announcements on uh, possible U.S. funding, but that is still uh, that is still an option that we may be making additional contributions. Okay, there's also been a spike in, in settler attacks on Palestinian villages <coughs> and so on, uh, vandalizing and so on. Would you call on the Israelis to prosecute the perpetrators of these crimes? I, I'm not aware of okay. that of that All specific right, let me case. Let ask you a couple more. Uh, there is a war of words between uh, the Palestinian chief negotiator Sai Berka and the president's envoy. Jason Greenblatt. Do you have any comment on that? Can you update us on what is going on, perhaps behind the scenes and so on? Well, I, I would just say that some of this is just another example of unhelpful rhetoric, which only harms the ability for both sides to come to the table and sit down and start to have some sort of peace negotiations. So it's certainly not helpful. We've talked about that before, and not having an escalation into what he refers to as the war of words. It's unhelpful. We don't consider it to be that. And finally, my last one, uh, all human rights organizations are saying that Israel has used excessive force in quelling the demonstrations in Gaza. There's going to be one tomorrow. You're likely to be out and so on. Do you have any stand on, on this issue? Are you going to issue a statement? I, I, Said, I know you've asked me that in the past. Uh, we don't issue a statement. We, yeah, we don't always issue statements mm -hmm. on uh, World events, uh, no matter how difficult they may seem uh, to people, sometimes we don't. We're not always doing that. Um, you know, I understand that Israel is in the process of reviewing um, whether or not excessive force was used in certain instances, and I'm not going to go any further than that. Sorry, on that, have you seen the 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 the, the, um, the, the, the Palestinian protest camps, the tents that they have, were, mm -hmm. that they're moving them closer to the uh, border fence. Do you have any any comment on that ahead of tomorrow? I, I have not seen that. Sorry. All right. And then just the last one related to this. How has the USAID investigation into its vetting and approval of the Palestinian journalist who was killed? Uh, how is that how is that going? Have you I don't have any I don't have any updates on you. I can double check on that and see if we have anything new on that. Um, okay, I'm going to continue to ask about this because okay. I either one of two things happened here: either the vetting is was not good, or the Israelis killed a, per, a journalist who was clearly identified as one. And I know that press freedom and is important to you. Mm -hmm. uh, you just began the briefing by yeah, introducing us to, yeah. to these journalists whose right. families have been. This guy, if he was a legitimate journalist, was killed. Uh, you talked about the Reuters journalists in Myanmar talked about journalists detained in Turkey, mm -hmm. and I think that it's incumbent on you if you really do, the country, the administration really cares about working journalists and their protection, that if it turns out that USAID was correct, that their vetting was correct, that this guy didn't have anything to do with Hamas, 
then I, I really think you should say something. So I'm going to continue. Matt, I certainly will. I will, I will look into that and see what I can get for you. Thanks. Thank you for the question. Uh, go ahead. If this guy was a Hamas operative, mm -hmm. the sniper didn't know he was when he shot him. It's just a kind of press vest. I, I, I was not there. I'm not aware of all the specifics, the details. I have not seen the scene myself. Only the television reports and some and still photographs. The Israelis aren't claiming it was an extrajudicial assassination. They're saying that they found out after the Understood. When I have more details for you, I will certainly bring it to you. And thank you for reminding me about uh, that case, Matt. Uh, Lori, hi. Hi. Um, the New York Times has a major story that Iraq is churning out death sentence for alleged involvement with ISIS. It cites 14 women convict, convicted and sentenced to death within two hours. A judicial assembly line was their term. What is your comment on that? I, I think overall, um, let's step back and take a look at Iraq and the tremendous number of issues that they're trying to deal with uh, to get this country back on track after ISIS had controlled uh, large swaths of that country and all that they have certainly been through. Um, we view this as overall an Iraqi process. However, um, we certainly recognize concerns about um, free and fair trials, and that's something that we continue to have conversations with the Iraqi government all of the time about ensuring those kinds of free and fair trials. So we have uh, shared that. We have shared our concerns and our principles and our beliefs with the Iraqi government on that matter. Are you concerned that the these are all Sunnis, that it could deepen sectar this very sectarian strife which led to the rise of ISIS in the first place? Lori, I can, I can just tell you we've had conversations with the Iraqi government about the importance of this and importance of a strong judicial system. Okay. And Brett McGurk has been in Erbil. Do you have a readout mm -hmm. on those? Meetings? I do, actually. Hold on one second. Um, I can confirm that Brett McGurk and also our uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary for Near Eastern Affairs, Andrew Peake, visited Iraq earlier this week. They met with senior Iraqi government security officials, and uh, they went there to see the progress that was being made in Iraq after the liberation of its territory from ISIS. They were in, uh, let's see, they were in Mosul, they were in Baghdad, and they were also in Erbil. Uh, they met with, if, if you're all are interested, I can, I can continue. There's more here. Yeah. Okay. Uh, they were accompanied by our U.S. ambassador to Iraq, Doug Silliman. Uh, McGurk and Pete met in Baghdad with Prime Minister Abadi, the Speaker of the Parliament, Salim al Jabouri, and other senior political, religious, and security officials. In Erbil, the delegation met with the Iraqi Kurdistan Regional Government Prime Minister Nechavan Barazani and Deputy Prime Minister Qabad Talabani. Meetings focused on ensuring the enduring feat, defeat of ISIS, including through enhanced security measures on Iraq's border with Syria and plans to defeat the remaining ISIS havens on the Syrian side. During their visit, the delegation had the opportunity to see firsthand the progress made in stabilizing the city of Mosul, as well as the magnitude of the remaining challenges in returning normality to Iraq's second largest city. McGurk and Peak visited a reopened market in East Mosul. They toured areas devastated by ISIS in West Mosul and visited Mosul University, where U.S. funded work to clear explosive hazards continues today. The United States and 25 other donors in the Global Coalition have pledged or contributed more than 34, excuse me, $834 million to UNDP funding st facility for stabilization in order to support the critical stabilization activities in areas liberated from ISIL control. McGurk emphasized the importance of partners fulfilling their pledges to ensure the UNDP stabilization projects are fully funded this calendar year. McGurk and Peak also welcomed the nearly $30 billion for Iraq's longer-term reconstruction pledged by 24 partners last month in Kuwait under the sponsorship of the EU and the World Bank. <coughs> the United States is committed to continued security, political, and economic cooperation with Iraq within the framework of the U.S.-Iraq Strategic Framework Agreement. The United States supports a unified, democratic, federal, and prosperous Iraq with a stable and viable Iraqi Kurdistan region. How about that for a readout? You know, usually our readouts aren't, aren't that detailed, but way to go for any, to NEA. <laughs> okay, anything else on Iraq? <laughs> uh, Elise, hi, go ahead. Um, it's a new topic. It's kind of a random one, but it's about the story um, about the U.S. Embassy in Germany um, who paid a couple of speakers, or one of them was the embassy in Berlin and another one was the consulate um, in Frankfurt that have paid as speakers um, people that have you know been public uh, critics critics of President Trump one of them calling comparing his rhetoric on Isis to um, comparing his rhetoric to Isis do you can you confirm that 
these people have been hired by the U.S. Embassy, and why, you know, why haven't they been vetted? I just think it's it's really weird. This has been subject of uh, quite a deal of conversation here in the building over the past few days. I've certainly read the reports, and I'm familiar with what you're you're talking about. Um, uh, the person who was brought uh, over to our embassy in Germany um, is uh, someone who was a Holocaust survivor and had been a uh, outspoken person on the subject of uh, extremist groups. And he was brought to our embassy to speak in that capacity. And so it was believed, I'm told, by our folks at the embassy that um, his background carried particular weight in talking about uh, ISIS and extremist activity. Um, with uh, uh, the German, with the German public, who would come in. This was a part of one of our speakers programs, uh, where in Germany they host 70 to 80 speakers every single year, and our people will um, look through their backgrounds and decide who to invite on behalf of the embassy um, on the basis of their credentials. But we don't look at their politics when we're inviting those people over. Um, our embassy was not aware of this individual's uh, comments that he had made, inflammatory comments uh, that he had made in the past. Um, and I could just say that he was brought over in accordance with the speaker's, uh, uh, the speaker's program that the United States government hosts at many embassies around the world. Uh, the person's air travel was covered and then also received some sort of a, a stipend. But, I mean, we've spoken a lot, you've spoken a lot from this podium. Mm -hmm about how the Foreign Service is completely apolitical and, you know, serves, you know, administrations, Republican and Democrat. And is there a concern um, that something like this could, you know, have a negative light on the Foreign Service that they're not supportive of the president's agenda? And, and, and let's make sure that we are uh, splitting this out. Um, we have Foreign Service here at the State Department, and uh, I found every single Foreign Service officer that I've worked with to be highly, highly professional and apolitical so this for that person matter. hired by I can't I don't, I don't know this person's identity. I believe this person was a locally employed staff working in concert with some of our other colleagues uh, at at the embassy in Germany. We also have our civil servants. Look, this is a seventy five thousand member organization. Um, my understanding and, and we've been dealing with this today and yesterday is that this person uh, that we were not aware of this person's comments that the person has said in the past. And uh, certainly that uh, puts the, in my view, uh, the State Department, people are right to ask questions about, what well, you know, did you look at this person's background? In my personal view, yes, people should take a look at the types of things that people have said um, to not put the State Department or our embassies in an embarrassing light. Um, obviously, this was an oversight on the part of the embassy. That's my personal view and oversight because I don't necessarily think that's a good thing uh, to bring in somebody who would make those types of comments. But on the other hand, we also believe in, in free speech. So uh, there's a, a sort of a delicate balance there. But isn't it, I, I understand what you're saying about free speech, but isn't it kind of self defeating when an embassy would have a guest that's publicly critical of yeah I you know I happen to agree with that I happen to agree with that completely um, would I have that person speak at a party that I'm hosting where it could come back and make me look poorly no absolutely not but uh, this person was selected based on the person's credentials that this person had been a Holocaust survivor that this person was some sort of an expert on violent extremist groups and that was a topic of the conversation that he was brought in uh, to discuss. Uh, I have been told by m all my colleagues that we were not aware of this person's uh, comments that he had made that were derogatory of the administration. I, I would, hold on a second. This is, seems honest, like you're about to head down a really slippery slope. I'm not familiar with this story. I don't know what these inflammatory comments were, but are you suggesting? You can Google it there. Uh, Just Google it, Matt. I, would, I know you like to look things up. Uh, or no, Dave Clark, he's the one no who's the expert. He's the expert at looking things up while really we're doing bad. this. <laughs> anyway, I'll take a look uh, at, at whatever it is. But mm -hmm. this seems to me, are you suggesting that the US, U.S. embassies abroad will now disqualify anyone who has been critical of the administration from speaking? People are brought in. I, I gave you my personal opinion. Okay, people well, are no, but further. You said you would, wouldn't invite someone to a party that so you would make it look bad. I mean, is there some kind of purity test going on? <laughs> Loyal, you have to swear allegiance to no, Matt. I'm just simply mean as sort of a, a public entity. Okay, at, at your company or any company of that sort, you'd have to you have to think about appearances and how things look. Well, 
So people are brought in to speak on behalf of our at our embassies, uh, regard, let me finish, please, okay. regardless of their political affiliations. Okay, and that's a good thing, you think, right? I, I typically think that that is a good thing, yes, okay. that is a very well, good if, thing, if because we believe so in different types extreme, of voices. Then, would then I have made that choice? Something. No, I but, personally would not have made but, that choice, and that was my point. But this, this, these, these speakers do not speak on behalf of the administration. Understood, yes. Presumably, they yes. speak on behalf of themselves. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure what, I mean, so if so, are you saying that you're advocating the idea that if someone has been critical in the past, uh, you know, just critical, saying, I think policy X is not a good idea, that they wouldn't, that they would then be disqualified from Matt, being I, invited? I, I don't think we really enjoy I don't I, know what the guy I, said. I, I don't, I'm just asking if it's a good public diplomacy stance for one of your speakers to talking about ISIS and comparing the president's rhetoric to ISIS. That's all I'm asking. <laughs> there you go. Okay. okay. Go ahead. Um, I wanted to meet you follow up to this one. Is oh, this, this go for that and then I'll. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Uh, the so much cooperation <laughs> today. Very <laughs> cooperative. Yes, exactly. you, you've just given us your personal opinion yeah. about an act of public diplomacy. You're Under Secretary of State for Public Diplomacy. Could you give us your opinion as the Under Secretary of State for Public Diplomacy on this decision? Are you admonishing the. Embassy. I would have to speak to the person who made the decision and have a conversation myself and better understand all of the details and how those decisions were made before uh, making further comments on that. Okay. Okay. Was there anybody from the State Department who accompanied Director Pompeo to North Korea? No. Um, would it be then fair to characterize that as largely an intelligence community endeavor? And, and I mean in the broader sense of planning the summit between the two uh, leaders. I can just say I'm, I'm not going to be able to get into the details of uh, Director Pompeo or U.S. government preparations uh, in terms of the preparations for the summit that President Trump intends to have with Kim Jong-un. So there's not a lot I'm going to be able to say about that. Do you need to get a special permit from the State Department to travel to North Korea because there's a travel ban and only special permits? <laughs> that is a good I'm question. sorry. I, you know, look, I can't get into the details of all that. I, if, if, if there, if there is, was, I, I, you know, I'm just refer you over to the agency there for that. Okay. I, look, I'm not going to be able to get into the details. Um, Obviously, our conversations and negotiations with North Korea, which we've shared with you, have been happening at a high level, uh, that we have had direct contact with the government of North Korea. For specifics, I'm not going to refer to that. I'm not going to get into those details, but I can tell you uh, we are having constant conversations and communications with our other agency and uh, department partners well, in preparation for this. Actually a, a good one. Can it's you check to see right. if diplomatic pass? Presumably, he has an official or diplomatic passport. Know. Well, can you look to see if they're covered by the passport ban? <laughs> I, I, I'm not aware of what kind. I don't know what kind of passport covered, he has. Well, but if yeah. if if if, it, if they are covered by this, then it would have been illegal for him to go unless he got the special. Um, Provision, in which case the State Department would have been aware, right? So just, the question is not about him specifically, it's whether official or diplomatic passports also require the special I'm, I'm, validation. I'm not going to get into the details of all the preparations for this. I'm not asking about okay. the details Kylie, of the preparation, I'm asking for someone to yeah. look at the, <laughs> look into it and find out whether the, whether all passports, including official and diplomatic, have to have the special validation for use to go to North Korea. That's Kylie, it. go ahead. Quick question on denuclearization, which you bring up all the time. Is there any reason for the State Department to believe that the U.S definition of denuclearization is the same as North Korea's definition of denuclearization at this point? I, I think we've covered this before, that Kim Jong-un has said that he is willing to denuclearize and is committing to do so, and we expect that as well on the part of the U.S. government. Uh, that is our policy. Our policy has not changed in any way. But, he's, but, but he, yeah. he said he's willing to talk about denuclearization. So your understanding is that is that is for sure North Korea saying that they will completely denuclearize some of the, their country. Obviously, <laughs> these uh, formal talks between the President and Kim Jong-un have not happened at this point, and so we'll wait for those meetings to take but place for further talks. What, what the U.S. definition of denuclearization At least we went over this two days ago. We went over this last week. I'm not, I'm not going to get but into Kim it again. But the North Koreans have said that they're willing to discuss denuclearization mm -hmm. of the Korean Peninsula. Mm -hmm. That's quite different than them committing to fit. Fully we look forward to having our conversations with North Korea about the denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula, and that our policy hasn't changed in any way. Wait, 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 wait. Yeah, but what? that's different than talking about denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula 
is a much different prospect than just the North Koreans denuclearizing. Look, we look forward to having those conversations. So is it. the U.S. willing to look at its nuclear posture? Elise, we look forward to having our conversations with the government of North Korea on this subject. So yeah. The Hi, Orrin. The, the North Korea and South Korean. Um, I, hold on. Wait for Orrin, please. Thanks. The, the North Korean and South Korean governments are getting ready to have their own summit mm -hmm. next week. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm uh, wondering whether, um, you know, what is, what is the State Department or, the, you know, the Trump administration's concerns about, um, you know, about what are their concerns regarding this, the talks that the North Koreans and the South Koreans are having? Uh, we don't have concerns about those talks. Uh, we understand that inter-Korean dialogue is something that is important. Uh, they have a lot of internal mm -hmm. issues uh, that those governments have to discuss, and I know it's very important to um, their citizens there, too. So we support improved inter-Korean relations. Uh, but we also recognize something that President Moon has said, and that that can't advance separately from denuclearization. So that is an, uh, a goal that uh, President Moon has um, still holds, as do we, and he has made that very clear that that's a big part of the conversation too. Heather. Okay. Yeah, hi, Jane. Thank you. Uh, South Korean government is preparing for the <coughs> declaration of the, uh, the end of the war with uh, North Korea on uh, April 27 when South North talks. Mm -hmm. uh, should denuclearization be the first priority or what is the well, U.S.? I can't name position? the priorities uh, for those two governments sitting down and having uh, their conversation mm -hmm. and their meetings. I can just say that we would certainly like to see an end, a formal end, uh, to the armistice, and that's something that we would support. Well, I'd like to see a formal end to the armistice in a peace treaty, right? <laughs> Not an end to the armistice yeah. and a return yeah. to hostilities. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Kim Jong Un's yes. goal is the uh, peace treaty and uh, withdrawal U.S. troops from South I'm, I'm Korea. I'm sorry. Repeat that again. Kim Jong Un's goal, final goal, is the uh, peace treaty and withdraw U.S. troops from South Korea. Is that uh, how did I, I think we're getting ahead, I think we're getting ahead of ourselves then uh, we are set to have our first meeting between the president and Kim Jong Un and uh, we'll see what comes out of that meeting but I can uh, I think folks are getting ahead of themselves when they start talking about US forces okay, okay. okay. this you know this this meeting between um, President Trump and Kim Jong Un um, I mean it's great they're having this meeting and they're you know whatever whatever they decide to do what's the time frame that that has been considered for how long it will take to accomplish the ultimate goal of denuclearizing the, the peninsula. I don't have the answer to that. That will be a lot of people, including our nuclear experts and people from the Department of Energy, people from the Department of State, from the agency, from the DOD. A lot of folks will have to be involved in those kinds of conversations that's, to that's figure to figure the, that out. That's one of the parameters that they're bringing to the table, isn't it? I'm not aware of that. Those The conversations uh, are ongoing between in the interagency about what we will uh, what we will ask for and how those meetings will work, uh, how the meeting with the president will work, and you know, beyond that, I'm just not going to get ahead of those meetings. Okay. Okay. Well, let me just let me get to some other people who haven't uh, who haven't asked questions yet. Uh, okay. Go ahead. Um, so, kind of going a bit back to um, the arm, like North and South Korean conflict, um, President Moon said that North Korea um, in their preliminary talks didn't demand withdrawal of U.S. troops from um, South Korea, and um, can the U.S. confirm that? Has North Korea said anything along those lines to you in the negotiations? I'm, I'm not going to get into conversations that we've been having ahead of that meeting. Okay. 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 Go ahead. Hi. Iran handed a death penalty to uh, Ramin Hossein Panahi, a Kurdish prisoner, and U.N. Um, human rights experts called it an unfair uh, sentence. Um, he was mistreated in prison and didn't have a fair uh, uh, treatment. Um, do you have a comment on that? I'll, I'll have to look in that case for you and see if I have something for okay, you. Okay, and also it. Iran and Russia and Iraq and Syria had a uh, intelligence sharing summit in Baghdad. Mm -hmm. Does that concern U.S. now Iraq is sharing intelligence with all those countries? I, I don't know exactly what Iraq shared with them. Um, certainly Iraq and other countries have a right to get together and have meetings of this sort. This is not the first time this has happened. And this on the meeting. Iraqi airstrike in Syria, were you aware of that airstrike? Uh, 
in Syria? Yeah, I, I can tell you that uh, the U.S. government was aware of that. The Iraqi government announced uh, that that airstrike took place. Uh, we – they have reported it today. It took part uh, – the Iraqi Air Force conducted that airstrike, and we were certainly aware of that. Uh, okay. Uh, let, let me get – excuse me. I'd like to get to other people before – Thank back. You. We're going to have to wrap it up in just a second. Ilhan, hi. Thank you, Heather. Uh, Turkey, uh, yesterday Turkish President Erdogan declared these early elections, mm -hmm. uh, what the opposition, opposition parties call it as ambushed elections due to very uh, short uh, term. Uh, are you, uh, do, do you have any confidence in Turkish government and the situation in Turkey, which has been going under the state of emergency for about two years? Uh, do you have any confidence that the Turkey is going to able to uh, hold elections in fair and free manner? Mm -hmm. I, I think first this gets back to the issue of the state of emergency, which has been in effect, as you point out, for about two years now or so. Um, during a state of emergency, it would be difficult to hold a completely free, fair, and transparent election in a manner that's consistent with Kurdish – or excuse me, with Turkish law and also Turkey's international obligations. So uh, we are aware of that. Uh, we are following this very closely. We have concerns about their ability to hold it uh, during this type of state of emergency. We would certainly like to see free and fair elections, but there's a concern here. Okay. Um, okay. Thank you. Um, so the President and you just supported an end to the Korean War, but the U.S. is the head of U.N. command. So what role is the U.S. going to play in uh, seeking an end to the Korean War? I can just say, look, we're, we're not getting ahead of the conversations that the President will be having with Kim Jong-un. We would like to see a resolution to that overall, but I'm not going to – I'm not going to get ahead of the President. And the okay? President uh, threw the summit into question altogether by saying that uh, he wouldn't have the meeting if it wasn't a fruitful meeting. Uh, so I, I don't think he threw that into question. I think the President indicated that if it weren't fruitful, he may not uh, complete that meeting. I think that's what he was saying. Okay. And then uh, just one more on the abductee issue, if you don't mind. But uh, President Trump said that he promised Prime Minister Abe that he would do everything possible to bring the abductees back to Japan. Mm -hmm. So did Director Pompeo raise that when he was in North Korea? I, look, I can't confirm anything about um, – about on that issue. Okay. 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 Um, pardon me? Is Pompeo mentioned about Kim Jong un, about U.S. citizens, detainees, they're going to release the detainee before talks? Whenever we have conversations uh, with the North Koreans, that is always an issue that is raised. Uh, safety and security of Americans, including those who are being held in North Korea, is a top, top issue for this administration, yes. Okay. Thanks, guys. We got to go. It's just about official. It's so presumptuous. Why? Because I don't think you will. It's so presumptuous. But okay. Well, I'm sorry. If you have an answer, that would be great. I'll see if I do. But gosh. It has to do with with EPA Administrator Pruitt's trip to Morocco in December. As you know, U.S. embassies and consulates often give support to official delegations abroad, and I'm just wondering if either the embassy in Rabat or the consulate in Casablanca. Uh, were involved or, you know, helped out with his trip. He went to Morocco in December. In December. Okay. Thank you. Thanks.